Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to our Sunday School series on the topic of Christianity and technology. This morning, we're going to be addressing the topic of transhumanism. But before I get started on the lesson, I do have uh, one quick announcement for you. Um, We have to move a couple rows of chairs after the lesson, so if you are available to stick around just for a minute, these back two rows of chairs right here in the front, we'll uh, we'll stack them and put them against the wall. Uh, we just need to create some space for an event that's coming up in the, in the fellowship hall. So if you're able to do that, these two back rows of chairs, we'll just stack them and put them against the wall. I'll try and give you a reminder after the lesson as well. Okay, so today, as I said, we're talking about the topic of transhumanism, which I had mentioned briefly last week in our discussion on artificial intelligence. But let me begin with this question. What is transhumanism? Any thoughts? Or Borg. Yeah, that's a, that's a good summary. So how many Star Trek fans do we have here? Okay. But how many of you actually know Klingon? All right. All right. Who are the true Star Trek fans here? Okay. No, no, no. Um, all right. All right. No, I just totally sh- showed my nerd colors there, didn't I? Okay. So um, anyway, yes. Uh, think like the Borg. Essentially, the concept behind transhumanism is it is a philosophy, a worldview, where the idea is that we could jumpstart the process of human evolution, that we can transcend the limits of human biology by means of technology, and there are various technologies that are used or um, uh, aspired to within the transhumanist movement. So we're going to be looking at this uh, worldview um, for today's lesson because it is very much... um, related to the topic of technology, and it's also um, a a rather influential worldview um, in certain sectors of society. So like in Silicon Valley, for example, big tech, um, this is a very influential philosophy in those areas of of life. So um, it it would be useful for us as Christians to be informed about this topic. In preparation for the class, I primarily relied upon one particular book, which I mentioned last week. It's called Humans 2.0 by the authors Fazali Rana and Kenneth Samples. They, uh, they work in a ministry called Reasons to Believe. Has anybody ever heard of Reasons to Believe before? It's a very good ministry. I'm a big fan of their work. I've read several of their books that they've published. I even use some of their resources in my curriculum at Westminster Academy. Uh, but this book is specifically on the topic of transhumanism. Humans 2.0 is the title. The subtitle there is Scientific, Philosophical, and Theological Perspectives on Transhumanism. I have attempted to condense the material in this book and make it digestible for you. These guys are professional scientists, and it shows in the book. It gets really technical at parts. So for those of you who are really interested in the science behind transhumanism, this is a really helpful resource for you. I'm just going to scratch the surface today. I'm going to introduce you to some of the basic concepts. Uh, I am going to get into some science and biology at certain points because I think as Christians we have to because there are points at which um, the aspirations of transhumanism clash with a Christian ethic, and we have to see how that happens and how we can respond as Christians. But essentially, we're going to look at three parts in today's lesson, and these correspond to the three parts of the book. Uh, In the first part of our lesson today, we're going to look at the science of human enhancement. So we're going to look at the specific technologies that are currently being developed that play a role within the transhumanist worldview. Then we're going to look at the ethics of human enhancement. What are some of the ethical challenges and problems associated with these technologies that are being developed? And finally, we're going to ask the worldview questions. In part three, we're going to compare and contrast transhumanism and Christianity. So as we move into this first part of the lesson on the science of human enhancement, I need to make a categorical distinction here because we're going to be looking at some technologies and we're going to be evaluating these technologies But it's helpful for us to understand how are these technologies being applied. And there are two main ways that these technologies can be applied. They can be applied for the purpose of therapy, and they can be applied for the purpose of enhancement. Now, uh, what do you think I mean by this distinction? That's right. Yeah, so therapy could be something like an artificial hip or knees, uh, a cochlear implant, for example, for somebody who is hearing impaired. 
Neuralink even. Yes, we're, we're going to be talking about Neuralink today too. I have a video. Hopefully the videos are going to work. So you can see I'm testing out our new presentation software today. I've been having fun with this. Um, but uh, yeah, hopefully all the technology is going to work for me today. But yes, therapy is about restoring um, lost function or healing sickness, something along those lines. But enhancement is for the purpose of going beyond the limitations of a healthy human body, right? To enable us to do things that we would not naturally be able to do. That's a very important categorical and ethical distinction that we need to keep in mind. Today, we're going to be looking at three main different technologies that are being developed um, and um, uh, promoted by transhumanists. The first is gene editing or gene therapy. Then we're going to be looking at neuroprosthetics, um, which are connected to uh, BCIs. These are associated overlapping concepts. Um, not quite the same, but they're very closely related. And then we're going to be looking at advances in anti-aging technology. So this is where I'm going to get a little bit technical with you guys. Um, just curious, how many um, medical doctors do we have in the room right now? Okay, we have at least one. Wait, did it, anybody in the back? John Lynn's not here, is he? Okay, so for this part of the lesson, um, I'm going to bring you back to your high school biology class, okay? We're going to have to look at how does DNA work. We're going to look at, like, what is a cell? Um, and this is important, okay? I don't want to, to lose you for this part of the lesson, but it's going to be very important for us as Christians to understand, at least at a basic level, how uh, human biology works, because this is where it's going to intersect with Christian ethics. So, when we talk about gene editing, first, let me just give you some of the basic categories associated with the topic of gene editing. We all know what DNA is, right? More or less. You know, that's like the, the coding within um, the, cell, the, the cell of every living thing. Um, that coding is, is stored within the cell in the nucleus, and that coding is then translated into the production of proteins and the building blocks for the cell so that cells can replicate and, and perform all their various functions. All that information is stored in DNA. And you might have heard how DNA is described as the shape of a double helix, so it's like a double spiral on itself. Well, let me break it down to you even further than that. You see how, like, in the image of the DNA strand there, it kind of looks like a twisted ladder? Each rung of that ladder is referred to as a base pair. So there are two, like, nucleotide bases that are connected together. And then what happens is the DNA, it, it opens up, and then RNA attaches itself and takes that information and transports it to where it needs to go and translates that information into, you know, the proteins. And that's how proteins are produced. I didn't lose anybody yet, did I? Okay. All right. So we have four base, uh, uh, nucleotide bases that you find within DNA. So think of it this way. DNA is like, um, it consists of um, four different nucleotide bases, which essentially make up the alphabet of DNA. So imagine we have an alphabet with just four letters. That is guanine, adenine, cytosine, and thymine. You don't have to remember this, but I'm just introducing the concepts to you. Now, if I remember right, G always pairs with T and A always with C? No. no. G is, pairs with C and then A always pairs with T. Is that right? Okay. Thank you. I knew I was going to mess up something. All right. So um, what happens then is think of it this way. Um, these base pairs are like the letters in the alphabet. Letters come together to form words. So words and phrases within the DNA, specific sequences of DNA, that's what we call genes, okay? So those genes um, are what uh, express the different functions of the, of the parts of the cell and all the things that, that make up your body, all right? So genes are those specific DNA sequences that consist of a particular sequence of nucleotide bases. So this is, this is um, by the way, I'm not a biologist, so I'm doing my best to try to keep it simple, but, but bear with me here, okay? So we have nucleotide bases of the letters. Genes are like the words and the phrases. The entire DNA um, sequence, uh, the whole thing would be like, you know, the, the, the whole book. You know, if your individual genome were a book, you know, all the DNA, um, that's what that would be. Okay. We also have to identify different types of cell in the human body. Um, there are stem cells, and I'm sure all of you have heard about the controversy over, like, stem cell research, right? 
So that's what we're going to need to discuss today because that's an important part of this transhumanist movement, the use of stem cell research. So stem cells are essentially cells that, uh, cells that can be developed into any of the various specialized types of cells within your body. Did you know that the human body is estimated to have about a trillion cells in it? There are about a trillion cells in your body. But of those trillion cells, there are over 200 types of cells. So you have nerve cells, you have blood cells, you have skin cells, and so on and so forth. All those different specialized types of cells are called somatic cells. Those are your body cells. That's the second category here. But all the somatic cells originally derived from stem cells. Stem cells have the potential to develop and be specialized into any of the specific types of somatic cells. And then a third category of cells would be the germ cells. These are the the cells that develop into your gametes, so the reproductive cells, like either sperm or egg. Okay? Um, This is going to be key because when Christians address the ethical problems with stem cell research, we have to know what we're actually dealing with here. So at a basic level, I'm trying to introduce you to these concepts um, because it's going to be very central to um, the, the ethics of gene editing. So we've talked about DNA. We've talked about the different types of cells. Now let me address the two types of gene editing. There have been different forms of gene editing, gene therapy that have developed over the past decades. Um, And so the two main types that you need to be aware of for our purposes are somatic cell gene editing and embryonic stem cell gene editing. Remember, somatic cells are the specialized cells that you find in the various parts of your body. So blood cells, skin cells, bone cells, and so forth. You can actually edit the genes of those cells by specifically targeting them. And we have the research to do this. Um, so we can, like, um, we can construct like um, retroviruses, for example, that can go into the nucleus of a cell and actually edit the genes of your somatic cells. We also can apply that same technology to embryonic stem cells. And there are um, uh, different applications for these two types of gene uh, gene editing. Because embryonic stem cells will develop into all of the somatic cells, it turns out to be a much more effective means of gene editing if you target the embryonic stem cell as opposed to somatic cells. Here's why. If you start with an embryo, you have just a small handful of cells, right? And those stem cells will then develop into all of the somatic cells. If you target the genes in those stem cells, it will affect all the cells in the body, right? But what happens if you just target a somatic cell? It's a limited application, right? It's only going to affect that targeted part of the body, which means the rest of the body is going to remain unaffected, which means you might not be able to treat the condition that is the goal of whatever the gene editing process is. So um, even though embryonic stem cell editing is more effective in achieving the results, it comes at a cost. Because in the process of doing this, it's often the case that the embryo is destroyed. And from a Christian perspective, if we believe that that embryo is a human person, well then that counts as homicide, doesn't it? That's why this is such a big deal for Christians. So it's important for us to understand these different applications of gene editing. So that's the most technical I'm going to get today. Okay, so we talked about DNA, we talked about the different types of cells, and we talked about the different types of gene editing. Next, I want to show you one of the um, uh, cutting-edge technologies in gene editing. How many of you have heard of the technology called CRISPR? You've heard of CRISPR? I'm going to show you a video that explains what CRISPR is. This video, it's just a couple minutes long, produced by the Mayo Clinic. Hopefully my technology is going to work for me. Let's see. In a document, if we suspect we've misspelled a word, we can use the find function to highlight the error and correct it or delete it. Within our DNA, that function is taken on by a system called CRISPR-Cas9. CRISPR is short for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. CRISPR consists of two components, the Cas9 protein that can cut DNA and a guide RNA that can recognize the sequence of DNA to be edited. To use CRISPR-Cas9, scientists first identify the sequence of the human genome that's causing a health problem. 
Then, they create a specific guide RNA to recognize that particular stretch of A's, T's, G's, and C's in the DNA. The guide RNA is attached to the DNA cutting enzyme Cas9, and then this complex is introduced to the target cells. It locates the target letter sequence and cuts the DNA. At that point, scientists can then edit the existing genome by either modifying, deleting, or inserting new sequences. It effectively makes CRISPR-Cas9 a cut-and-paste tool for DNA editing. In the future, scientists hope to use CRISPR-Cas9 to develop critical advances in patient care or even cure lifelong inherited diseases. Okay. So it's pretty surprising what we're able to do with this, this technology. CRISPR really is revolutionizing the, the science of gene editing. Okay, so um, this, the book that I'm using, Humans 2.0, was published about five years ago. Some of the technology has developed since that time. Since the publication of this book, we have seen the first FDA-approved CRISPR therapy. It's called CASGEVI. It's for the treatment of um, um, sickle cell disease. And so um, it, it, it is a seen to be a, an effective treatment for sickle cell disease. Uh, and CRISPR technology turns out to be um, an effective means of treating a variety of, of different types of diseases. But there are technical problems that come with uh, this process of gene editing. Here are some of the difficulties that we face. Currently, CRISPR technology is used for treating what are called monogenetic diseases. Monogenetic diseases are diseases that are caused by one single gene, okay? So that is a limited number of all the, the diseases that we experience as human beings. Um, and so the problem, though, with that is that limits the possible applications that we have. And here's one of the difficulties that we face with doing gene editing, even to treat monogenetic diseases. Sometimes these genes serve multiple functions, so if you have a genetic condition, like you know, sickle cell disease or, or something along those lines, what if that same gene also codes for some other function that's essential to being healthy? What's going to happen to your body if you edit that gene now? Well, sure, you fix the disease, but what, what else have you harmed? What have you hurt in the process? That's one of the difficulties. Similarly, sometimes we have like a single function that is governed by multiple genes, and it becomes exponentially more difficult to treat a condition that is caused by multiple genes, right? So we have a limited application here for the effectiveness of gene editing. Here's another technical problem that we face with gene editing. Sometimes a given, gene, uh, a given DNA sequence, a given gene, looks very, very similar to another DNA sequence, Right, so it might be like a neighboring gene that, that looks similar to it. The problem is sometimes that CRISPR uh, technology, it, it's intended to target a particular gene, but it goes after the wrong gene because it looks similar to it. So th these are called off-target effects. And so uh, one of the challenges that scientists and researchers are facing is to make sure that they're actually only targeting the gene that they intend to and not other sites within the DNA sequence. That's another difficulty. I've already alluded to the problems with somatic cell gene therapy. So remember, these are the specialized cells within your body, like skin cells and blood cells. Um, we do have gene editing and CRISPR technology that can target specific somatic cells. The problem is these types of therapy are localized. They're only getting at the cells that are being targeted. And the, the effectiveness is temporary. Because a lot of these somatic cells are regenerative. That means over time they replicate and sometimes the, um, the um, old, old uh, gene sequence comes back. And so you have to go back for recurring treatments um, to experience the, the benefits of the gene therapy. And as you do that over time, your body can actually develop a, a, a re, an immune resistance to the gene therapy. So over time it becomes less and less effective. So a lot of research is proposing, instead of going after the somatic cells, what if we use this gene therapy on embryonic stem cells? So here's the idea. Suppose you have some genetic disorder, let's say sickle cell disease, and you've identified the gene that is causing it. What you could do is through in vitro fertilization, you can target that gene in the embryonic stem cells, 
and ensure that the editing takes place in all of the necessary stem cells. And so as the embryo develops, as it's you know, re-implanted within the womb of, of the mother, um, it will develop to have um, completely edited genes so it no longer has sickle cell disease. Hypothetically, this technology could eliminate certain genetic disorders. But in order for that to happen, you'd have to use IVF on a wide scale to everybody who has this genetic condition. And there is a word for that. We call that eugenics, right? We've tried that before, right? It's not a pretty process. We've seen some of the applications there, and it can be pretty horrific. In addition to the ethical problems of the um, unintentional deaths, and sometimes intentional deaths in the research phase of, of doing gene editing on embryos. And as Christians, if we treat these embryos, if we regard these embryos as living human persons, that's not justified, right? And so these are some of the challenges that we are dealing with when it comes to um, gene editing. Now let me move to the second technology that we'll address today, neuroprosthetics and BCIs. All right. Who recognizes the video clip there? Yeah, that's right. Empire Strikes Back, right? So that's Luke Skywalker's prosthetic hand. Um, yeah, you can tell I've been having fun with our presentation technology now, can't you? So anyway, um, you get the idea here, okay? Neuroprosthetics would be types of prosthesis that hook directly into your nervous system. Now, um, these are, they're related to but distinct from what are called BCIs or brain-computer interfaces, the difference being a neuroprosthesis is intended to restore the lost function of some part of your nervous system. So like cochlear implants, um, visual prosthetics would be, con would, be, would be considered forms of neuroprosthetics. BCIs would be those technologies where your brain is talking to a computer. And that computer is translating the electrical output from your brain into what your intentions are, and it translates it into certain functions, like moving the cursor on a computer screen or, or things like that. We actually do have technology that can do that now. So how many of you have heard of Neuralink, Elon Musk? So that's what they are doing. They are developing BCIs. And so I have a video for you, hopefully this one's going to work as well, which is a promotional video by Neuralink. Let's see if this one's going to work. Hey, I'm Nolan. Um, seven years ago, I dislocated my C4-C5 while swimming in a lake. There were a lot of things to adjust to. Some things I would have never guessed would be difficult became very difficult. It's Nolan's biggest dream right now to become independent. I hope that this study not only helps him to do that, but it also helps technology to advance in quadriplegics. I'm really excited to be a part of this Neuralink project. I want to help out people down the road as much as I can. moved the cursor with my mind, it blew my mind for like a whole day, and to be helping to be able to be useful in some way, it completely changed how I live. It's pretty incredible that we have the technology to do that, isn't it? We can read the electrical output of a person's brain and translate that into the movements of a cursor on a computer screen. That's what Neuralink is doing right now. And so there are all kinds of applications that exist for neuroprosthetics and BCIs. I've mentioned some of these already. So we have cochlear implants, for example, which serve the function of an ear. Um, there have been developments in visual prosthetics. So you take a camera and you connect it to a person's visual cortex, and it, that can be translated into visual stimuli in the brain. Um, there are robotic limbs. So people that have um, paralysis, for example, um, they can use BCIs in order to control robotic limbs. Um, and exoskeletons, and there's all kinds of um, applications for this. How many of you have ever heard of uh, a movie that came out a few years ago with Matt Damon called um, Elysium? 
where he actually wore like this, you know, exoskeleton suit. And um, that was kind of like a dystopian picture of where uh, transhumanism could take us. That was kind of a scary, uh, uh, scary uh, portrayal. Uh, okay, there's also the development of uh, electronic skin. So material that can be um, uh, interpreted as uh, uh, the sensation of skin by your brain. Um, I already said that one, didn't I? Uh, let's see. Uh, Locked-in syndrome. So do you know what locked-in syndrome is? This is where a person has experienced uh, paralysis to the extent that they're actually not able to communicate at all with anyone. They, they can control their eyes, essentially, and that's it. So they basically have no means of communicating with the outside world. But through neuroprosthetics and BCIs, we can perhaps overcome some of those, um, uh, the, the, the difficulties of, of uh, the, the challenges faced by those with locked-in syndrome. And then there are also applications for people with a variety of types of neurogenerative disorders, like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, where through certain electrical uh, stimuli from uh, machines, it can, it can uh, stimulate the parts of your brain that are causing these um, neurogenerative problems and ameliorate some of the, uh, the symptoms. Uh, epilepsy would be another condition that could be treated in this way as well. So we're actually seeing a lot of technological progress in these fields of neuroprosthetics and BCIs. Um, and so it's really exciting to see what we are actually able to do. And I think from a Christian perspective, we're maybe, ethically speaking, we're not quite as alarmed by this technology as, say, like gene editing, right? And so I'm going to come back to that point later on. But there are still technical problems associated with these technologies. This is a very expensive technology, at least right now. And so um, it's not going to be widely accessible anytime soon. Um, it's still largely in the research stage. You know, like Neuralink is, has only begun clinical trials. Um, so that patient that you saw on the video, uh, Noland uh, Arba, I think was his name, he was the first patient of Neuralink. And um, as of just a couple months ago, um, they've already experienced some setbacks. Uh, he reported that, uh, I think he believed, I, I believe he said that 85% uh, of the wires that were implanted in his brain had become completely detached. So that was kind of a disappointment. Um, and so uh, Neuralink is now looking for, or I think they've announced their second patient in clinical trials. And so they're moving forward. They're trying to overcome these technical difficulties. But there have been challenges. Um, another problem with these um, uh, technologies is just their sheer size. They're not exactly portable. Um, it requires a lot of equipment in order for these technologies to work. And so there's the mobility problem. Also, you need a power source to, to, to make these technologies work. And our, our power capacities right now are limited for these technologies. Often they rely on batteries, and batteries have a limited lifespan. There's also a problem with um, a lot of these technologies generate a lot of heat. So one of the problems, for example, with like um, visual prosthetics is... Um, these cameras and all the equipment that are connected to them, they produce heat, which can actually cause damage to the patient's retina. And so there are just all sorts of technical problems associated with it. When it comes to the BCIs as well, um, so this is when a, a, your brain is talking to a computer, um, there's a trade-off here. The more effective the technology is, the more invasive it has to be. So we have technology where you just implant like an electrode on your scalp, and it can read the electrical output from your brain, but there's all sorts of distortion in the signal in that way but because the electrode has to read the, the, the electrical signal through your hair, through your scalp, through your skull, and so it doesn't get a clear signal. So what you could do is do surgery and implant um, the, the, the sensors into your brain, which works and is more effective, but the problem is that can cause damage to your brain. It does lead to brain damage in some cases. And so they're trying to develop technologies that minimize that, that, um, that, the damage and the invasiveness um, to these technologies, but um, that is still a technical hurdle at this point. There's also the difficulty of data transmission and compression. This is something that Elon Musk just tweeted about a few weeks ago. Um, the problem that Neuralink is facing right now is there's just so much data to process, um, and the compression rate is uh, our, our capacities right now are not what they need to be. And so they're trying to find ways of improving the compression rate without losing any of the data in the process. So you can see there's all kinds of technical hurdles um, that are connected with these types of technologies. But nevertheless, 
it is pretty exciting to see what we are, at least in principle, able to do. And perhaps with time, we will be able to overcome some of these technical hurdles. Now, the third technology that I'm going to look at today, in addition to the gene editing technology and the neuroprosthetics and BCIs technology, we're going to look at anti-aging technology. And of these three fields, this one is arguably met with the least success in recent years. Uh, the problem that a lot of researchers face right now is we still don't really know what causes aging. There have been several theories, and they get really into the specifics of the, 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 technical, the technicalities of the various theories about what might contribute to aging um, in the human body. And these are some of the potential candidates for the major factors that cause aging. Um, it could be caused by DNA mutations and damage that simply happens over time in a person's body as the cells replicate themselves. Sometimes, you know, mutations accumulate just randomly over time, and that causes degradation to the cells in subsequent, you know, um, uh, generations of cells within your body. Uh, another leading candidate for causing aging is just the process of oxidation. So we all know, like, our bodies need oxygen, right? We, we breathe oxygen, and that is used as a source of energy for all the cells in our body. But oxygen is kind of a double-edged sword. It's necessary for our, our bodies uh, uh, as a source of energy, but at the same time, oxidation can also cause damage to the, the parts of the cells of the human body. And so um, that's a potential candidate. There's also um, the... the potential factor of mitochondrial damage. So um, the mitochondria, if you remember from your high school biology class, is the powerhouse of the cell. This is where energy is produced in the cell. But over time, again, like this part of the cell becomes damaged. Um, and, it's, and it's thought that this could be a leading contributor to um, the aging process. And then another major candidate uh, for the aging process is uh, telomere loss. Does anybody know what telomeres are? Ever heard of telomeres before? So these are like the end caps on your chromosomes. And over time, these telomeres get shorter and shorter. So with each, you know, generation of cells in your body, those telomeres shrink. Uh, and, and that is thought to be one of the factors that causes aging. It's also thought potentially to be associated with um, conditions like Alzheimer's, I believe. Um, now, not every cell in your body experiences telomere loss. Some don't experience any telomere loss, in particular cancer cells don't experience telomere loss, which is why um, uh, cancer cells hypothetically could be immortal. They could last forever. Uh, and so those are some of the possible causes to aging, but we're not entirely sure. Nevertheless, people have still attempted to develop technologies to um, extend the human lifespan. These are some of the technologies that have been developed. Now, as of yet, Nobody has found a substitute for just the traditional methods of extending your lifespan. Diet, exercise, healthy living, you know, avoid cigarettes and excessive alcohol, don't engage in dangerous behaviors. Just living a basically healthy lifestyle is the most, most effective way of extending your lifespan. Uh, and everyone will tell you this. But this hasn't stopped the transhumanists. Transhumanists still see death itself as a technical problem to be overcome. And they are trying to develop ways of making the, hu the, the human beings immortal. And so some of the proposed technologies that have been put forward um, have been things like telomerase activation. So this would be the, um, the, the, the protein or the, the, the enzyme that uh, activates those telomeres. Uh, and so that would undo the, the, the problem of the loss of telomeres on your chromosomes. So that is thought to be one of the potential ways that we can treat aging, um, the problem of aging. Gene therapy, again. So if there are genetic causes to aging, it is thought that we can use something like CRISPR te technology to target those cells um, and, and to ensure that, uh, that the, the, the genetic code does not degrade over time. And lastly, some people have proposed stem cell replenishment as a treatment for aging. So, uh, as I mentioned, some cells in the human body can regenerate over time, but others do not, or they regenerate very, very slowly. So, like nerve cells, muscle cells, um, the cells in your brain do not regenerate over time. That's why, like, if you injure your spinal cord, for example, there, there really is no treatment for paralysis, at least not yet. But potentially, 
There could be a treatment by means of stem cells, because remember, stem cells can be turned into any of the types of cells within your body, including nerve cells or muscle cells. So it is believed that we could, hypothetically, cure paralysis through stem cell replenishment treatment. So these are some of the technologies that have been proposed in efforts to um, overcome the limitations of human aging. Now, there are other technologies that we could address that are associated with transhumanism, but I think these, these three are kind of the leading, cutting-edge technologies that really um, garner the most attention. So gene editing, neuroprosthetics, and anti-aging technologies. That's the science. That's the most technical I'm getting today. But today, um, uh, with the remainder of our lesson, I want to look at the problem of the ethics of human enhancement. What are some of the ethical problems and challenges associated with transhumanism and all these technologies that we've looked at so far? Now, I've already mentioned one of the ethical problems, the difference between therapy and enhancement. Okay, so therapy is treating a sick or an injured person, restoring them to health. Enhancement is about going beyond the limitations of a healthy human body so that we could do things that we would not otherwise naturally be able to do. Do you see any ethical problems there? Unintended consequences, yeah. So um, if, we, uh, if we attempt to, to use these technologies for the purpose of human enhancement, can we foresee all of the unintended side effects? Um, uh, and so, uh, yeah, one of the problems is, like, in, in essence, in human enhancement, we're essentially playing God, right? We're trying to take our creational design and manipulate it and transform it into something that God did not intend from the beginning, so I think if we evaluate these categories in terms of the biblical storyline, we can say that therapy is legitimate in general in the sense that we're simply trying to mitigate the fall. We're trying to ameliorate the effects of the fall. You know, sickness um, and, and disease and injury, those are results of the fall. And there's nothing in principle wrong with, with technologies that address those problems. At least I don't see any. I mean, in principle, isn't that the same as like, you know, wearing contact lenses or setting a broken bone, or medicine, vaccines, and so forth. Um, what, what we do with these technologies is, is we're trying to uh, promote health um, among those who are sick or injured. But that doesn't require, like, redesigning the human body. On the other hand, um, if we're using these technologies to improve on an already healthy human being, that's where we move into the category of playing God. And... Um, and that's where I think a lot of transhumanists are just blatantly disregarding some of the ethical limits of a Christian worldview. They don't see our creational design as an ethical boundary for human action. They, they don't see us as having any more significance or dignity than any other material object in the universe because they believe in the end that's all we are, our material objects. And so... Um, here are some of the ethical costs that are addressed in the book, Humans 2.0. They talk about the problem of the loss of human worth and value. So um, most transhumanists have no regard for the life of an embryo, right? They, they don't come from a pro-life perspective, and so they don't affirm the personhood of unborn life. And so um, in that regard, they're, they're just disregarding human worth and dignity and value. There's also the problem of the loss of human identity, so the question is, if we do, hypothetically someday, develop the technology to completely rewrite the human genome, the product of that technology, is it still human? That is a real ethical question that we have to wrestle with. Um, there is a sense in which our creation design is what makes us who we are. And if we tinker with that, we're something else. And so there are ethical problems with that. There's also the ethical concern of the loss of natality. Natality refers to, you know, the, just the, the process of, of childbirth, of bringing the next generation of children into the world. But transhumanists, what they're trying to do is develop technologies to prevent death in the first place. Now, if they, um, uh, if they, I don't think they will, but if they succeed in doing that goal, then what that means then is, the children of the next generation are no longer a, regarded as a blessing. They're seen as a liability. Their competition for jobs and for benefits and, and treatments. Um, and so uh, what you see among a lot of transhumanists is, 
a, a, a disregard for the traditional family. Um, and so we see that um, widespread uh, in our culture. Um, a lot of progressive ethics um, at their root are um, a disregard of the traditional family structure. And transhumanism is no different. There are also ethical concerns associated with a potential loss of freedom. If we have these technologies, um, what rights will people who opt out of these technologies be deprived of? Right? Uh, we, we don't know what the consequences will be in terms of, like, are human rights still going to be respected for those um, who, who don't um, participate in these technologies? And that is associated with the loss of justice. It could cr create, like, a class system within society where those who are um, involved and supportive of these technologies and those who, who do not support them. Um, and we don't know what could happen uh, in a society where this happens. At a more fundamental level, I think transhumanism faces the problem of it has no real ethical foundation, though. Um, the ethical principles of transhumanism can be categorized in these ways. In terms of egoism, in which each individual acts in self-interest. In terms of libertarianism, where the goal is maximizing individual liberty. Utilitarianism, in which promoting the greatest good for the greatest number is the basis for ethics. Uh, relativism, where we have subjective and changing standards. There's either individual relativism or cultural relativism. And then pragmatism. Whatever works is what is good. These are really the ethical foundations for a transhumanist uh, a philosophy, for a transhumanist worldview. And this is not sufficient. This is not a, a, a durable, valid foundation for human ethics. Because there is no deeper metaphysical foundation that it rests upon. It essentially turns human ethics into a matter of personal preference and a will to power. That's what we're left with if all we have is a, a, a transhumanist worldview. And that is in stark contrast to a Christian ethic, which is rooted primarily in the doctrine of the image of God. Human beings have dignity and value and worth according to a biblical worldview, because God created us in his image. And because we reflect the image of God, each person has value. Each person is distinct. Humanity is exceptional in the universe. It's what sets us apart from animals and the rest of the created order. This principle is so foundational to Christian thinking about ethics, and it's entirely absent from the transhumanist worldview. And when we keep in mind the doctrine of the image of God, it completely reorients the way that we look at these technologies like gene editing and neuroprosthetics and anti-aging technologies. And so what we're seeing is a fundamental clash of worldviews between transhumanism and Christianity. And so what I've done here is I've, I've, I've translated some of the material from the book into a chart for you so that you can see some of the basic worldview differences between transhumanists and Christians. They have conflicting views of God. For transhumanists, there is no God. But for Christians, there is. And he is infinite, eternal, good, transcendent, and tripersonal. And he is the ultimate foundation for our ethics and our entire way of living. There's conflicting views of the world. For transhumanists, the material universe is all there is and all there was and all there ever will be. But for Christians, the universe was created by God ex nihilo, which means out of nothing. And so the universe is dependent upon God from moment to moment for its existence. There's conflicting views of knowledge. For transhumanists, science is the only or at least the best reliable method of knowing about the cosmos. But for Christians, true knowledge is available through both general and special revelation. When it comes to ethics, transhumanists would say that morals are simply the product of evolutionary instincts. But Christians would say that there are objective moral values which are grounded in God's own perfect moral character. Transhumanists have a different conception of human beings. They would say that we're just evolved primates. But there is no fixed human nature. We are capable of self-transformation and bringing ourselves into a post-human state. But Christians would say that we're created in God's image, and therefore we all have inherent dignity, even though that dignity is now marred by sin. And so there are these conflicting principles of creational goodness, but also sinful fallenness at work in the human heart. 
Uh, and then there are different conceptions of history as well. Transhumanists would say that history unfolds according to purely naturalistic processes, which include the use of human technology. In addition, we could say that transhumanists also buy into what's been called the myth of progress. That as science and technology advances, we'll continually improve ourselves, and, and that process will go on indefinitely, in principle at least, and so that we can continue to improve ourselves until we reach this utopian post-human state. By contrast, Christians would say that history unfolds according to God's sovereign plan, and that plan is structured according to creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. So these are clearly opposing worldviews, and they're incompatible. So with all that said, how should we as Christians engage transhumanists? Well, we can begin by acknowledging points of common ground with them. We do have shared yearnings. We recognize the problem of human suffering and death, and we long for rescue from those problems. And so there are real human longings that transhumanism taps into, but it gives the wrong answers. It gives the wrong solutions. And that's where we can present a better alternative. We as Christians can challenge the myth of progress. We can highlight how science and technology, yes, can be used for great good, but it can also be used for great evil as well. Just look at some of the horrors of the 20th century that resulted from human science and technology. There's no guarantee that we're heading towards a utopia especially given the reality of human nature, our inherent sinfulness, our inherent selfishness. We can also highlight some of the technical challenges associated with these um, um, sciences, um, these the scientific fields like anti-aging and gene editing. Um, we still have a long way to go, and it's not clear if, um, if and when we're going to reach dead ends in some of these technologies. So, it would be unwise to invest too much hope into these technologies where it's still not clear where they're taking us. And then we can also highlight a lot of the ethical shortcomings associated with transhumanism. The loss of human dignity and worth, the loss of freedom and justice, and all those potential dangers um, connected with these technologies. And then fundamentally, we can highlight a different perspective on the future. There's a Lutheran theologian named Ted Peters who distinguishes two ways of looking at the future. And he uses the terms futurum and adventus to distinguish between the transhumanist vision of the future, which is futurum, and the Christian vision of the future, which is called adventus. And here's what he has to say about the difference. Adventus is the appearance of something new, a future that can be expected or hoped for, but it cannot be planned for. Adventus provides a vision of a future that only God can make happen. So we do believe that we will one day overcome the limitations of death and sickness and sorrow and disease, but we're not going to be the ones responsible for making that happen. That's beyond our capacity as human beings. But that is a gift that God is going to give to his people. He is going to renew us. He is going to rescue us from the effects of the fall when Jesus comes back. That's how the biblical story ends. Everything that transhumanists are hoping for, God is going to give us. We don't need to usurp his authority in order to experience those blessings. That is our promised inheritance as Christians. And that's why the Bible ends um, with Jesus saying these words. And he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. We're not the ones making all things new but we worship the one who is making all things new. And that is the good news that we can share with those who are um, attracted to transhumanism or committed to transhumanism. And we can highlight these shortcomings and we can show them that there is a better way. So that's all I have to say about transhumanism today. Now let me ask you, do you guys have any other questions or comments about anything I've said today? A lot of technical material today, I know, but hopefully that was... Not too overwhelming for you. Van, was your hand up? Yeah. There, there is a certain irony in the fact that, you know, they're developing all these technologies allegedly for the sake of improving human life, but in the process, they're disregarding the value of human life. Yeah, you're right. That's a very valid point. Mike? Yeah? I mean, I, I'm not so familiar with the politics of how hospitals work, but I imagine that could be. Yeah. Belinda? Dysgenics? Discgenics. Okay. I gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, uh, 
there's a whole lot more that could be said about stem cell research. Not all stem cells are embryonic stem cells. That's right. There are even adult stem cells in your body. Like you'll find stem cells in your bone marrow, for example. And so there have been alternative stem cell therapies that have been developed that don't involve the destruction of a human life. And so I think those are potentially promising technologies from a Christian perspective. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Bill, what does that mean? So, yes, cryogenics, it's, that's one of the technologies that was briefly mentioned in the book, but they don't really unpack it at all. But, yes, that is another potential technology that, that's associated with the transhumanist movement. So if we don't have the technologies yet for transhumanism, just freeze the person and then maybe later on thaw them when we do have the technologies available. Yeah, um, there's been some sci-fi movies about that as well. Yes, um, and there, there are certain technologies, yeah, like... Um, Somatic cell nuclear transference is a technology mentioned in the book where you like take like the DNA from a person's nucleus and then you insert it into another person's egg. You like you remove the nucleus from the egg and you can stimulate that egg so that it will turn into a clone and that is it becomes a living embryo. Um, and so there are ethical problems with that as well. So cloning is very closely associated with the ethical challenges of stem cell research. So there's a lot more that could be said, I know. If you have other questions or comments, feel free to come talk with me. Uh, for next week, we're going to get into a little bit more practical stuff. Um, I'm going to be reading a book called Digital Liturgies by Samuel James, where he's talking about some of the ways that our exposure to technology today is, is affecting our own hearts. So this is going to be a more pastoral lesson for next week, and that's going to set things up for Drew's unit. And so he's going to wrap up this series on technology by talking about social media. So he's going to be teaching for three weeks in a row after me. So my final lesson for the series will be next week on digital liturgies by Samuel James. So that's all I got for you today. Um, can I close us in prayer? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that um, you have made us in your image and you have given us the gift of, of understanding and rationality so that we can um, develop these technologies. And we pray, Lord, that uh, you would give us wisdom as Christians as we navigate all of the technical and ethical challenges that come with developing these technologies. I pray, Lord, that you would give us discernment as we engage with others who come from a conflicting worldview. I pray, Lord, that we would be able to speak graciously, but that we would um, hold fast to the truth and that we would not compromise on what your word declares. And I pray, Lord, that um, we would be faithful in the midst of whatever um, hostility or persecution we may face as Christians, but that we would honor um, uh, your creational order and that we would hold fast to your promises as we look to your restoration of all things. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.